Welcome to this episode of Pearls of the Interior Life. Today we're going to be looking at some aspects of our soul just to keep us ever mindful of that spiritual aspect of our being. And mindful is a good word to use here because we're particularly going to be looking at those distinctions of our brain and our mind and our soul. Our big goal is happiness in this life and heaven in the next. To achieve this, we need to stay close to God throughout each day. But how do we do that while living in the real world with all of its challenges and distractions? Growing our interior life through Christian mental prayer is the answer. This podcast mines the riches of the greatest spiritual tradition on earth so we can grow in holiness together. I'm Steve Smith. Thank you for joining me for Pearls of the Interior Life. Welcome, and thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for making this time for God. You know, we've been on a hiatus for a couple of months as we were wrapping up our book and our mobile app, so it's nice to be back. The book, 30 Days to Christian Meditation, is available on Amazon now, and that mobile app will be coming out shortly. Uh, so again, nice to be back. And, you know, it is not lost on me that uh, in the last couple of months the world continues to attempt to pull itself apart at the seams, and you know brings us always back to those words: "Be not afraid," and not to make light of uh, whatever your personal situations may be. To be sure, trials and suffering are always going to be a part of our our life here on earth. But again, be not afraid, and our example always is Christ, and you know, we look at him in the Passion when he's there in Pilate's court, and all around him it's chaos and division and disorder, but there is Christ in the midst of it, perfectly calm, perfectly in control, and that's where we look in this chaos that we experience, in the chaos and the disorder in our lives, we look to Christ for that peace. And where should we start looking for him always? We start looking for him in our soul. And so that brings us to today's topic, our human soul. <laughs> it's a huge topic. We're just going to be looking at a few perspectives, especially now that we're getting back into these regular installments of Pearls in the Interior Life. It's good to go back to basics, and there's little more foundational than our spiritual soul because that is... Um, key to what makes us human, key to how God created us in his image. So we're going to look at a few perspectives today just to help us remain mindful of that, especially nowadays in the hustle and bustle of the world. It's easy to lose sight of that spiritual aspect of our nature, just to get caught up in the material aspects of the world. So these are, are just a few considerations today that you may find useful. I think all of this is probably going to be fairly familiar to those watching this video, but maybe some different ways to keep um, mindful of your spiritual soul, maybe different ways to, to uh, communicate that reality to others in your life. So first, just for recap, what is our soul? Well, human nature, and there are two aspects of it that are integral, our physical body and our spiritual soul, and, and they are truly integral. We are a union of the two. We are enfleshed spirits, it's sometimes said. Now, our interior life and our spiritual soul are intimately connected. We're always concerned about our interior life, our interior life, more, more than just our, our thoughts and aspirations, things going on in our head, our relationship with God. and. Without a spiritual soul, we wouldn't have an interior life. We would just have an interior. We'd just have our brains. We would just have atoms and molecules and chemicals and electrical impulses and ganglion and synapses and, and that stuff. That's not, well, it's life. It's biological life. Yes. Is it interior life? Is it true human flourishing? No, no, far from it. So that's where our soul comes in, where we are made in the image and likeness of God, specifically in our powers of intellect and will, our intellect, where we have creativity, where we have self-awareness, where, where we have knowledge of God, our, our will, where we act on things, where we have self-determination. It is in those powers that we're made in God's image and likeness, and those powers are powers of the soul. 
So there's that mysterious transition where we go from purely our material brains to our mind, which interfaces with our soul or spiritual powers. And these days that is um, a very foreign concept and it's easy just to lose track of that ourselves and just focus on the material. So here are some different perspectives. There are different ways that we can approach this. Here are just a few things to keep that in the forefront. Um, you know, we can certainly approach it just from our own experiences. Most people consider themselves spiritual beings. They have that sense that there's something more than just the physical. We can certainly dig deeper into that. We, we can approach it, especially from theology, from what's been revealed to us by God. And then we can also go quite a ways through scientific observation. So let's start there. Let's start with some scientific observations. Okay, we're gonna take a little bit of a detour. First, let's go into the cosmological perspective of things. And if we go back to the creation of the universe and the Big Bang, as it was first theorized by Father George Lemaitre, that at the start of time, at the start of history, at the start of the universe, there was that initial tremendous explosion from which burst forth everything that we now know as the universe. And as you may be aware, in that envisioning of the beginning of the universe is a singularity. So what's critical about a singularity is all information gets lost at the point of the singularity. We can only see from that point forward. We can't see a nanosecond before it. We can't see what the universe was like before that moment. And and science and mathematics recognizes that it's an integral part of the fabric of things. Similar to breaking and scrambling an egg. You know, if someone gave you a plate of scrambled eggs or an omelet and you had never seen an egg before, didn't know what it was, you couldn't extrapolate from that omelet what the egg looked like. You'd not be able to get there. Similar to the singularity at the beginning of, of the universe. You know, we can get tantalizing hints of things from that point forward, can't see prior to it. Now, we know why that is, because prior to it was God. And there is no craft that humans possess. We do not have the capability to conceptualize the fullness of God. Okay, that's consideration number one. Consideration number two. Now, if we go from the grand scale of the universe down to the smallest building blocks of matter, science is always hard at work trying to dig deeper into that. What happens at the smallest scales? of matter and the primary way that science investigates that is with particle accelerators and the idea is I'm sure you've seen or heard of these things and kind of like a racetrack you get small particles going racing around faster and faster and then you smash them into each other like in a microscopic game of chicken and they break up into even smaller particles and this helps shed light on some of the foundational aspects of the underworking principles of the universe. What is gravity? What is this invisible force that attracts two masses together? How does one mass know, if you will, that another mass is out there? How does gravity actually work? I mean, you know, we know how to measure it. Certainly we know the gravitational constant, but that's much different than understanding the underlying principles of why gravity why should that be? So we have these atom smashers. Well, to get to ever smaller particles, to break these things up into smaller pieces takes more and more energy, bigger and bigger particle accelerators. It's theorized at this point that a particle accelerator powerful enough to split things down to the most fundamental units of matter would need to be about the size of the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, so what, what do we do with that? Well, let's say at some point in the future, we were even able somehow to conceive of, of some kind of a gadget that could accomplish that. Whether it's the size of the Milky Way galaxy or we come up with some other way to create the effects such that you can break things into smaller bits of matter. 
Well, you and I know what would inevitably happen is we'd find there's something still more mysterious behind it, that we need a yet more colossal gadget to dig even deeper. And if we came up with that gadget, we'd need another one after that. There's always going to be another mystery, always another mystery. Because the underlying principle, the underlying unifying principle, the underlying sustaining principle is God. And he's infinite, so we would need an infinite gadget to be able to understand completely how the universe works, how matter works. All right, so where does, where does that go? We see a pattern developing here that we can do marvelous things with science and it, and it, it sheds so much light on the universe and how magnificent it is. But always there's that greater mystery that at some point even science acknowledges you know, we can't pull that curtain back. We can't answer that question. Now we come to human consciousness. And here we have what's known as the hard problem of consciousness, which you may have heard by Professor David Chalmers. He coined that term. The hard problem of, problem of consciousness. How does our brain work at the level of consciousness, of self-awareness? What makes us so much different from say, a chimpanzee? And science acknowledges that we are a world apart from a chimpanzee in terms of self-awareness, in terms of consciousness. And in fact, that Professor Chalmers, who coined that term, he has uh, stated that really we, we need to start from scratch and we need a completely different approach to trying to understand human consciousness. We're barking up the wrong trees. We may need to consider things like a, a universal consciousness. It sounds a little like the body of Christ, doesn't it? But what do we see happening here? We see the same pattern in the physical world that eventually we butt up against mysteries that science can't penetrate. We're seeing that develop in human consciousness. That is because science is starting to come hard up against the human soul. And we know that this is a spiritual phenomena. It's outside of the realm of what science is going to be able to completely penetrate. No doubt it will get really very tantalizing hints at it. It's like all of creation you know, is giving us these tantalizing hints of God, but we're never going to be able to penetrate that completely. So there's one way of remaining aware of, of the marvelous mystery of our soul, our consciousness, the, these powers that do indeed separate us from the lower animals. All right, here's another one different approach is from demonic activity not to get lost in the macabre here we'll come back out in the light pretty quick but theology is consistently taught that demons they're very powerful beings you know we understand them both from revelation we understand them from from theology that they're still just created beings they're uh, wholly beneath god and there are very real limitations on their ability to interact with us. And what becomes very clear, particularly from cases of possession and from very experienced exorcists, are these limitations in practice that demonic spirits only have very limited ways of interacting with us. There are aspects of our being that are closed off to them and specifically our soul yeah that's that is a, a no man's land for for the demonic so they have access to our brain our physical brain imagination memories yeah that is where they can harass us they can tempt us but the demonic has no power over our intellect and our will. They, they cannot force us in our self-determination. Even the people that have had uh, cases of tremendous demonic possession have always been in control of their will. Yes, there's tremendous, again, harassment and temptation there, but they've always had, they were always aware that they were still ultimately in control. Again, that distinction between just our material brain, and that is where the demonic does have access and can torment people, and our spiritual soul with our intellect 
and our will. Again, the, these uh, different scenarios of possession illustrating how that is a completely different aspect of our human nature. And that is, in this case, is closed off to the de demonic. Okay, so a few different ways of, of looking at our soul. Again, why? Why do we want to always be keeping these things clear and before us? Because not only is the soul where we have our spiritual powers of intellect and will, most importantly, why did God create us with our soul? Because God is a spiritual being. God is pure spirit, and so in, in the life of God and the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, always together in that, that loving embrace that we're invited into, that's truly interior life. We enter into that through our soul, otherwise we don't have the hardware for it. You know, we can't pull them up on our cell phone or, or what have you. We interact with God through our soul. That's why he gave us that gift so we could literally commune with him. So it's always a very healthy thing for us to be going back and to again and again reminding ourselves, even amidst the busyness, the craziness, the distractions of the world, that that is a very small part of reality, the much greater reality, and especially the much greater reality of who we are, who we're created to be, is rooted in that spiritual soul. So yeah, we're going to be coming back to this topic again and again because it's so critical and foundational to our relationship with God and our neighbor and everybody else. With that, in our daily emails, we'll build on some of the concepts we were talking about here today and keep us focused on our spiritual soul. And so thank you again for allowing me to share in this time with you and the Lord. And I look forward to being with you again.